You mentioned the lawsuit, which was filed in a federal court on Monday by the Center for Constitutional Rights on behalf of the Palestinian Human Rights Group's Defense for Children International Palestine and Al Haq and several Palestinians who are inside Gaza or are U.S. citizens with family there. Uh, as you mentioned, among the plaintiffs is the Electronic Intifada's contributor, Ahmed Abu Ar Artema, one of the founders of Gaza's Great March of Return, uh, whose nearly 13-year-old son, Abdullah, was killed in an Israeli airstrike on October 24th. Joining us to talk about this is Sadaf Dust. Sadaf is an attorney and a Bertha Justice Fellow at the Center for Constitutional Rights. Uh, she's one of the lawyers representing the Palestinian plaintiffs who brought on this lawsuit. Sadaf, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me and for all the awareness that you all are raising. Thank you. Can you begin by talking about uh, the legal definition of the accusation of genocide and genocidal intent? Um, what is the crime of genocide? And, and, uh, and let's kind of use that as a foundation to talk about uh, this lawsuit. Sure, and just to take a step back, uh, it's important to note that this lawsuit was brought against President Biden, Secretary of State Blinken, and Secretary of Defense Austin in their official capacities and as representatives of the United States government. And it was brought under the United States violations for customary international law, which Ali, as you have mentioned, is part of federal common law. And the two claims that this lawsuit brings is the United States violation of the duty to prevent genocide, but also the United States complicity in genocide. And so specifically when we're looking at genocide and the claim of genocide, um, that occurs when there are certain acts which are committed with the intent to destroy in whole or in part a group. And that group can be identified by national, by ethical, by racial or geographic grounds as well as religious grounds. And in the lawsuit, that group is the Palestinian people of Gaza. And as for the underlying acts that you look at when you're looking at genocide, that includes the killing of members of that group. So the killing of members of Palestinians in Gaza, which is in over 11,000 as of today. Um, Another underlying act that would constitute genocide is deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life, which are calculated uh, to bring about physical destruction of that group, again, in whole or in part. And a, th a third underlying act could be uh, causing serious bodily or mental harm, which we're seeing now that Palestinians in Gaza who are injured are in the tens and thousands. And uh, this lawsuit lays out in the complaint day by day accounts of Israeli official statements showcasing their intent, showcasing the fact that they are calling for the complete destruction of Gaza, for the elimination of Palestinians. Uh, October 7, when this most recent military assault was announced, Prime Minister Netanyahu specifically said that there would be an unprecedented military assault. And so the statements of genocidal intent have continued from October 7 every single day, multiple times a day. And when you pair that with the underlying acts that are being committed, the case for genocide is irrefutable. It's very clear. Uh, and as far as the second or, or the claim for the United States duty to prevent um, under customary international law, there is a duty to prevent genocide which is established the moment the United States learned of or should have learned of the risk of a genocide in Gaza. And this duty kicked in on October 7, based by not only the statements that occurred on October 7, showcasing intent to destroy the Palestinian population in Gaza, but the military assault that began on October 7. Um, and Again, on October 9, there were additional acts that were created that further advanced this unfolding genocide. And that was when the complete siege of Gaza was announced that um, humanitarian aid would be blocked, electricity, fuel, food, water. These are basic necessities that would bring about the physical destruction of an entire people. And so the United States, as Ali and Nuri, Nuri have mentioned, it's extremely 
important given their influence that they have on Israel through this decades long history and partnership, but also as U.S. officials have stated themselves and as Israeli officials have affirmed that there is a partnership between the United States and Israel during this military assault and genocidal campaign, that U.S. and Israeli officials are standing shoulder to sh shoulder. Um, and so that's where complicity kicks in, which is the second claim brought forth in this lawsuit. And in addition to not only the political cover that the United States is providing and the diplomatic co cover in international forums. The United States is funding this genocide. The United States is sending material weapons weekly. And as soon as October 7, that was made very clear that that would be happening. And we have seen multiple junctures of time that this has continued, this material support has continued. Sadaf, um, what, you know, the, I, I know that the Center for Constitutional Rights filed um, a preliminary injunction asking the court to put in place an order that would end U.S. military and diplomatic support to Israel. Um, what happens next? What does that trigger? Uh, and and yeah, what, what are the next steps? So the preliminary injunction is another mechanism that would require a response in an emergency hearing. So a response from defendants and an emergency hearing from the court, exactly as you said, asking for intervention. And this is important because lawsuits, they have their own timelines. Sometimes they can be prolonged, but a preliminary injunction is a step that can happen even before the lawsuit develops and continues to progress through the different stages. And we expect to have a hearing 35 days um, or within 35 days, and more information will come about after that hearing, as well as um, the different legal and advocacy efforts that can occur between then and after then as a result of the preliminary injunction. And what can happen if the court finds that Joe Biden, uh, Blinken, and uh, et al. are in violation of the Convention to Prevent Genocide, um, what would happen? Well, it would be monumental. I am not aware of a case where a sitting United States president has uh, had a lawsuit brought because of their complicity in genocide and their failure to prevent genocide. And so this, the preliminary injunction and in the lawsuit asks for the intervention of courts um, to ensure that the United States does fulfill their legal obligations. And in this case specifically, we're asking for there to be a cessation of all military support, for there to be a cessation of the funding, the continuous weapons that are being sent over to Israel, which would have an impact in in Israel's ability to continue to further advance this genocide. But in addition to that, there are a number of different uh, pressure points that can happen as a result and leading up to this preliminary injunction hearing. And that is for more pressure to occur for the United States to stop blocking efforts that many other countries are calling for in trying to um, ensure that a ceasefire does happen, which I want to be clear, that is the bare minimum here. A ceasefire yeah. is the bare minimum. The United States has had a decades long history of supporting Israel and, and enabling them and encouraging them even at times to carry on this military assault and continued military assault against Palestinians. And so all of this will come to light through this lawsuit in a way that is in a permanent public record, a state record. So, Go ahead. Sadaf, I, I'm just, uh, I was very happy to read the lawsuit and that this effort is going ahead. I, I also, uh, it's very uh, painful to read the accounts of the Palestinian plaintiffs like Ahmed Abu. Uh, Abur Tema, who I mentioned, and also uh, Munadal Hadzallah, who uh, 
is also a plaintiff, a Palestinian American plaintiff, and has lost more than 60 members of his extended family due to the Israeli bombing in Gaza. My question is, is there any kind of precedent for this? Are, we know that the courts in the United States are very deferential to the government and very rarely um, will try to tell the executive what to do. I, I think in the case of a genocide, you have to try everything. Is this a long shot? Does it have any chance of success? What, what do you think? What are lawyers saying? Well, we certainly don't know what defendants will say. They have a couple of weeks to respond. Um, but what I can share is that just last year, the U.S., within the context of Ukraine and Russia, made a submission to the International Court of Justice. And they have held the same standard, put forth the same standard that we are asking for today and saying that applies here, which is that the moment that a country is put on notice of the risk of genocide, there is a duty to use all measures within their power to prevent that genocide. So this isn't novel. The law is very clear. It's unambiguous. And quite frankly, it's black letter law that the political branches have already accepted and have already pushed forth as black letter law. So what we're asking the court to do is to simply uphold the law. Uh, it, it can't be more clear than that. And of course, there will be efforts to undermine the law, but the administration itself has recognized the importance of a state doing everything it can within their power. And in, in the case of the United States here, there is a heightened responsibility when there is that kind of relationship with the perpetrator um, to prevent genocide. All right. Uh, well, we're going to leave it there. Of course, we're going to be following this uh, lawsuit as it winds its way through federal court um, very carefully. Sadaf Dust, you are a lawyer at the Center for Constitutional Rights. Um, thank you so much for your work, and uh, we'll have you back on very soon. Thank Thanks you so, so much. much for having me. Bye. Thanks for watching this video. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hit like, leave a comment. These engagements help us with the YouTube algorithm and it helps us to get around Silicon Valley censorship as much as possible. It does make a difference. You can also support our journalism by going to electronicintifada.net and clicking on donate now. Thank you.